Good evening, everybody. Welcome to webinar 87. Goodness, 87 webinars on a Wednesday. That is a lot of webinars. A lot, a lot of webinars. Of it's yeah, a lot of Wednesdays, it is, isn't it? Yeah. Everybody is very welcome. We're glad you're joining us. It's good to have you here. While everyone gets sort of settled and is coming in, um, say hello in the chat. Tell us who you are. Set your chat settings to everyone so that we can all see your messages and tell us where in the world you are, as usual. Tell us what you've had for your tea, if you've had any tea. I've just been deliberating with Dave whether I can make chips out of a kohlrabi which came in a vegetable box. So I'm not sure about that. I'll find out later. Uh, and um, yeah, tell us, are you a student? Are you a social worker? If you're a student, you know, whereabouts in your studies are you? Let's get to know you. Be good to see you. Also, since this week's all about reflective practice, um, reflecting on your day, um, what's made you smile? Let us know in the chat. I've got to tell you, Dave, I'm sorry, but I've just seen this. Angie, an apprentice, it says she's actually on annual leave in Cyprus and she's uh, tuned in tonight. She's in see. Cyprus on holiday. We that's love you too, Angie. And I mean, that's that's commitment for you, that is, isn't it? Right, okay, okay. Everyone, congratulations all around for your smiles. I'm glad you're smiling and you're happy. Yeah. And um, let's let's keep smiling while we think about reflection. Yep. Okay. Thank you very much. Over to Siobhan. Over to, yeah. It almost sounds like a challenge, that. It almost sounds like a challenge, Let's keep smiling. Actually. Let's keep smiling, talking about reflection. Almost as though, you know, oh, you can't smile and reflect at the same time or something. But that was that was lovely. It was a really and uh, maybe that's what we should do from now on. So what if you had for your tea and share some lovely news with us? Because it's really nice, isn't it, to be lifted up by other people's news. And so makes you smile, doesn't it? So okay. So tonight, welcome to our session on reflective practice. We've actually done quite a few webinars on reflective practice because when we started these webinars, all those two oh, two years ago then um, the idea was that we would do them about reflection and theory, because that's what I'm known for, really. I'm known for stuff around social work theory and critical reflection. So we said, well, we'll just do that for a few weeks. And of course, it's just expanded and expanded. And now we keep thinking we can't keep going back to reflection, doing the same thing. We've done something on reflective writing. We've done a session on reflective journaling. So these are all ones that you might want to watch back. So when we were thinking today about each season, we're trying to do something on reflection. And we were thinking when we were planning this season, what could we do in terms of reflection? And the team really like thinking through models of reflection. And so we thought we'd revisit that, but we'd want to think about reflective practice and complexity in social work. Because sometimes the more complex things become, the more difficult it is for us to reflect, but actually reflection is the key in terms of dealing with complexity. So we thought we would look at complexity and relate that into reflection because really social workers are always in the midst of complexity. It's what we deal with all of the time. Social work is an incredibly complex role in many ways really. I think it's um, Ruth Allen in her definition of social work, uh, she talks about social workers always being in the midst of the messy stuff and that's it really. I think we're in the midst of the messy stuff and complexity. I love this image of complexity of just it's all knotted up you know because I like to think about and I talk quite a lot when I'm um, in supervision with students, I will uh, talk to them about knotty problems. What problems have they got that are knotty, that are kind of tied up? And you know, when you've got something like, I don't know if you've got a chain for jewelry or anything like that, and it all gets knotted up and you can't unknot it. So what, what is it that's knotty for you? And for me, I think that's where good reflection starts. So, you know, when you're asked to reflect on something, what is your knotty problem? What's that problem that you're struggling with? You know, where you've got this knot and you're trying to find the end of it. And so that's why I like that image, really, of complexity. It's like everything's tied together. You can't see the end. You don't know, you know, even sometimes you pull in from the middle because you've not got a hold of any end, really. Everything's very complex complex 
So I think of knotty problems. That's the phrase that I would use is that knotty tied up problems. One of the phrases that's used in the academic world for that kind of thing is wicked problems. I always feel that's a bit, it sits a bit uncomfortably really, I think because of the use of the word wicked, but it, it's, it's widely used in academic circles. Wicked problems are referred to, Rick Hood's work on complexity in social work is really good. And, and Rick refers to uh, Rittle and Weber in the 1970s. So long time ago, not long after I was born, we're talking about wicked problems. And they described wicked problems as being characterized by, they've got no definitive formulation. So you can't look at two problems and think, well, that's formulated in the same way as that one. That's like a knotty, the knotty problem, isn't it? Knots are different each time. Wicked problems, they say, relate to multiple issues. So it's difficult to recognize when you've reached an end point. There's all that kind of thread in the image before you can't find when you've reached an end point because you've got these problems that are just so multiple there are so many different elements to it and they're uniquely configured so that <clears throat> what works in one situation might not work in another situation and this is said to be a wicked problem i i prefer the phrase knotty problem but i get the idea that this is what we're working with very often in social work is we're working with these actually really difficult situations and that means we're working with complexity i love theory you know i love theory complexity theory is actually a really complex theory in itself it's not from social work it's from the world of science but i think it has quite a lot to offer us actually as social workers and complexity theory starts on the basis that complexity in itself is dif difficult to define how do you decide that's complex but that isn't complex i mean how do you do that how do we decide this is complex but what complexity theory does that i think is incredibly helpful for us as social workers is it points out that something can be complicated but not complex so for example a task that's got lots of different stages to it is complicated but if you follow the steps step by step then the task can be reliably completed so i was trying to think of an example earlier i thought what example can i give of something that's complicated but not complex you know you can follow it through step by step maybe um chris and dave or we uh, often talk about food you know so they have this conversation about that vegetable that i've never even heard of and what they're going to do with this vegetable that i've never even heard of so i thought could we use cooking you know you can follow a recipe but if you follow it step by step you're going to get there it's complicated potentially but not complex but then i was thinking oh i don't know whether that works as an analogy so then i was thinking about i've been making a lot of flat pack furniture recently because i've moved somewhere new and i've been putting together loads of flat pack furniture and stuff and that's been very complicated because it's got all of these steps but if you follow them a step at a time it normally works it's complicated it's not complex but if you've got something going on, like someone else is talking to you, you've lost a screw or that this tool isn't working or that's not happening or that, then it becomes complex. The problem with social work at the moment, I think, is if you were to take, for example, <clears throat> the Children's Social Care Review in England, a lot of those recommendations seem to look at social work as though it's complicated. We can give you a step-by-step -step answer as to how it should be resolved. But it isn't. It's more than that. It's complex. The thing about social work is it's complex. Sometimes even the most simple thing in social work is complex because if you look at it, traditional linear thinking about relationships between things are based on the idea if you do A, B will happen. And that's the complicated stuff. A leads to B leads to C. It's the step by step. Chaos theory in science, that says that A could lead to anything. A could lead to B, C, Z, Q. It could lead to anything. Complexity theory sits somewhere in the middle. And complexity theory says, look, A could lead to B, but it might also lead to C. And there's even a possibility it could lead to D. 
And that's because whether A leads to B or C or D is going to be about really small variations in that initial, that A. And people are different. I mean, I'm looking at the team now and there's not many of the team here tonight because there's so many things going on for the team. But I'm looking, you know, if, if David and Kai and Tony Lee faced the same situation, each of them would do it slightly differently. And if they face that same situation tomorrow, they might do it differently again tomorrow. So the small variation in that initial A is going to lead to a different outcome. And that's the thing about social work. We're working with different problems every day. OK, there might be some similarities, but there's going to be some difference. And we're working with different people on different days at different times. You're going to get different outcomes. And that's what makes it complex. The way that people are trying to look at social work at the moment is, and I found this image on Google, and I think it's a brilliant image to describe the way that policymakers and yes, the England Children's Social Care Review is looking at that complexity and saying, well, there you go. If you just do this, it works. A will lead to B. Well, actually, we know as social workers, it doesn't because it's all that complexity that's going on outside of that policy making room. Social work is incredibly complex, even from the start of your journey, even from your first year placement. Now, over time, you'll deal with more increasing complexity. But everything that we do, to some extent, is complex. And really, from that starting point, I suppose what I'm wanting to say to you is that working with complexity isn't linear. You can't just deal with this in a linear process driven way. There's another there's a, a famous quote about recovery in mental health services, that recovery isn't linear. That recovery goes round in circles for a while sometimes and then it goes backwards and then it goes forwards and then it stops for a bit and then it moves on again and that's the complexity most of what we do though in contemporary social work is driven by linear processes that don't necessarily fit I think that's a particular issue in reflection. And that's what I want to unpick a little bit tonight is if you look at the image on the screen, you've got all that complexity underneath going on and you're trying to deal with it with a linear model of reflection. It's not going to match. You're going to end up writing descriptively. It's not going to work. And I think we started off with somebody saying, uh, I'm really looking forward to this tonight because I struggle with reflection. I would say reframe that. You struggle with the models of reflection that you're being given. It's not reflection that we struggle with. It's the processes and the ways we're expected to do it. Each of us has to find what works for us. Everybody can reflect, but you need to develop that skill. You need to work on that skill. You can't expect it to happen overnight. We, we all have to work on it, but we all also have to keep on searching out what's going to work for us and what's going to work in that situation. And so that's what we're going to look at tonight, recognizing that complexity isn't, doesn't, you know, when we're dealing with complexity, you can't just use an A will lead to B kind of approach because that's not necessarily going to work. So in working with complexity, we also need to see some of the simplicity. My view is that good social work sees the simplicity in the complexity. Bad social work makes stuff even more complex because we throw hoops in and things at people. Good social work finds the simplicity in the complexity. And so to do that tonight, we're going to start off by thinking about and exploring when we reflect, just clarifying the stages. And the reason I'm going to clarify the stages is the main focus of tonight is to look at different models and to try and get you to um, think about which style of model is going to work for you. To understand how the models differ, the best way to do that is to understand when we reflect, because then you can start to recognize what kind of model is going to suit. So in terms of when we reflect, 
a lot of social work training will say to you that there are two stages of reflection. And I, I, I'm always arguing with academics about this because they still say there are two stages of reflection, but actually there's more. The two stages that you hear about a lot come from Schoen's work, his book, The Reflective Practitioner, published in the 1980s, the most popular book still referred to in terms of reflective practice across all professional groups, not just social work. So he wrote that there are two stages of reflection. There's reflection in action and there's reflection on action. Reflection in action is what you do in the moment, right now. How you change things up as it's going along. I know as a trainer, as an educator, I can find reflecting in action much more difficult with new ways of working. Because if I was in a room with a group of people, I'd be able to look around and think, the mood's a bit low, I need to lift it a bit. Or I think, oh, people are writing lots of notes, I'll stick with this, this must be an important point for people. Or, oh, people need, you know, I need to move to the next point, people look like they know this. I've not got any of that when I'm teaching online. So what I'd say to you, all of you, is if you're in a training session online or you're in a lecture online, put your camera on, help your lecturers to make it more interesting and more dynamic because it's really difficult to do that if you've got nobody looking at you, if you've got no feedback, you're simply talking at your laptop. So the team tonight, because we're, we're, there's not so many of us tonight, we're all keeping our cameras on tonight and people are nodding at me and stuff. So it helps. It helps me to think, OK, this is hitting all right or it's not hitting all right. Or And that's one of the things that we do for one another as a team is kind of do that so that there's some sensory information for me whilst I'm delivering, so I can change it if it's not working. What that does is it shows how important your senses are when you're reflecting. So when you're out on a visit during your placement, or even when you're sitting in a lecture theatre or whatever it is, get in touch with your senses. How do you feel? What are you hearing? What are you seeing? How do you feel? Are you feeling a bit chilled? Are you feeling a bit scared? Are you feeling, why? That's the first point is get in touch with your senses because the senses and feelings and emotions and everything else is going to be connected. So reflection in action, that's in the moment, what you do, how you change things up as you're going along. Reflection on action is what you do later. So when we finish tonight, we usually finish about eight or 10 past eight or so, don't we? Then we'll, I'll look back and I'll think about what went well tonight, what didn't go so well, maybe what should I have changed for the session? We actually, as a team, have a debrief. So we meet quickly after the sessions just to go back on it. And we do that because we know that to reflect on action, you often need to draw on feedback from others. And Shern says that. Shern says, when you're reflecting in the moment, you've only got yourself. At the moment, I've only got me to think, oh, quick, change it up. I'm looking at others to get a little bit of sensory information. But it's only later that I can really draw on how did other people see it tonight? What was their perspective? So reflecting on action, it's vital to draw in feedback from others. It's not just about how you felt. It's about how other people felt. And what do you think about that? And do you think the same or differently? That's reflecting on action. So that's Schoen, two stages of reflection. Quite a long time later, nearly 10 years later, Killian and Todnam added the third stage. Now they're coming from an engineering background and they've talked about, as engineers, you can't think, oh, do you know what? We'll build that bridge. And if the bridge falls down, we'll reflect on it later. No, you've got to reflect before you build it, haven't you? You've got to front load your reflection. So they talk about reflection for action. They use the same phraseology that Schoen did because it had been so popular, but they're talking about reflecting before, front loading our reflection. I think that's vital in social work. We talk a lot, don't we, in serious case reviews about looking back with hindsight and how, oh, if we'd have known that at the time, we'd have done it different. We do a lot of hindsight stuff. We need to do more foresight, more looking ahead, more reflecting for. We've talked about this before and we've given some suggestions in some of the um, webinars. I think the last reflective practice webinar we did on developing confidence, we looked at reflecting ahead and a specific prepared model that we developed for that. 
But these are the three stages of reflection, reflecting before, during and after. If you're a student, it seemed like lots of you are students when you're introducing yourself. I think we've got a lot of student audience tonight. This is replicated when you do your direct observations of practice. Think about it. On placement, you have to write something before you do the piece of work. That's reflection for action. Then during the observation, you're reflecting in the moment, you're changing it up as it goes along. And then afterwards, you write up the reflection on the observation. So you're doing before, during and after. It kind of replicates it. It's all about planning. So we need to know about these stages of reflection before we go on to looking at the structures of reflection. We don't want it to be just all me talking tonight. So a couple of team members are going to share their thoughts. And so we're going to start off with Kulchuma's thoughts about um, reflection. Uh, so Kulchuma, I don't know if you want to share with people that you have finished now. And this is your first week in your first qualified job, isn't it? It so is, congratulations yeah. from all the team on that. Thank You're you. You're no longer a student now. No. So um, as Siobhan said, I have finished my uh, final year, just waiting for my final grades to come through um, and to know what my classification is. Um, and I have just started my first job as a social worker in a school. So it's, it's not in a statutory setting, but I'm enjoying it just as equally. Um, and throughout my placements, I've had to do a lot of reflection, um, so reflect to write up reflective logs um, to put into my portfolio. Um, and reflection, it's, it's something that's vital in social work, not only just for your learning, but for your practice as well, because you look back at what's happened and you learn from events that have happened or from your colleagues. And that plays a really important role so what I found when I was doing my uh, reflective logs is, especially in my final placement, because it was such a busy environment and everything was so fast paced, I kept forgetting things that had happened. And when I came to write my reflections, I kind of struggled because so many things had happened and sometimes I'd get events mixed up. Um, so then I started to write them down in bullet points because it was so fast paced, I couldn't write them in detail. So what I would do is each day, just write down little bullet points of what happened, how it made me feel, what my learning was, how it might have impacted the family that I've supported. And if at the top of my head, I could think of, you know, in England, we use the professional capabilities framework. So if I could link it to some of those domains, I quickly jotted them down as well, because then I knew actually I can link it to this and it allows me to meet that. So if what Siobhan has just said, me doing those bullet points, I'm planning for reflection so that when I come to write it, I can look back and think of actually these events have happened, but this one seems like a really significant event and I can really get my teeth into this reflection and really analyse what's happened and how it's made me feel, what my learning was, why I learned it and how I do things differently. Um, and that's really helped me to sort of keep on top of my learning reflective logs um, and to sort of keep on top of my practice as well, because when I've done the reflective logs, I've looked back and I've thought, actually, I can see the growth in my practice because when you come to, when you go back to read through your reflective logs, you see, well, actually, this is the stage I was at when I first started my placement. But then you can see that progression as you continue to read on when you're sorting out your portfolio. Um, and it gives you that sense of achievement as well, that actually, no, my reflections have come along and I have come along myself as a professional, so to speak. Um, so those are sort of my sort of thoughts on reflecting while on placement. Fabulous. Thank you, Kultruma. I like that idea of bullet pointing as well, because like you said, not only is it, I mean, you described it as sometimes um, not remembering the event, but I also think it's remembering your feelings and what, what were you actually feeling at that time? Because your feelings change and you can't remember how you felt at that time. So actually the bullet points can also be helpful for feelings as well, can't they? So can. um, I really like that idea. So thank you very much for that. And congratulations on your new job role. It's fabulous. Thank you. So we'll move to thinking about 
models of reflection and there are lots of different models of reflection i think probably in the chat probably dave's talked about the reflective practice prompt cards and i know lots of people who come to the webinars have those prompt cards there's 52 cards in this set of cards 52 different prompts the idea of it was there's a different one for each week of the year and that a student could take out a new prompt and it's kind of getting you to think differently and develop that prompt that reflection across the year so there's loads of different models there's probably about 30 different models actually that we could use to reflect and then there's other things that aren't models of reflection but you could use them as a point of reflection so there's so much out there, there's so much available, but actually that in itself could be overwhelming. You know, Kulchuma talked about it's overwhelming sometimes getting all of the, the reflections written, but the what's on offer for us to be able to do that could be potentially overwhelming. So the key thing I want you to get hold of from tonight, and I do want you all to ask and make sure you feel clear about this in the chat is, I'd like you to get hold of what is the difference between a process model and a component model? And if we think about all that knotty stuff that we had at the beginning in terms of complexity, this is the bit that I was trying to come at in terms of complexity is a bit knotty, it's a bit all over the place. So if you look at this slide in front of you now, there's pictures and there's words. And that's to help those of you who are visual learners and those of you who are verbal learners. I'm visual, so I'm gonna look straight at the pictures. The word process in blue there has got six little circles surrounding it. They're numbered from one to six and they're joined by a dotted line. Really, that's what a process model looks like. Let me explain what that means, okay? The fact that there are six stages to it, that doesn't matter. There could be three or there could be 10 or there could be 15. It's not the number of them. It's the fact that they are numbered. They're numbered because you've got to do them step by step. It's like the A, B, C linear stuff. You can't think to yourself, do you know what? Fancy a bit of a change today. I think I'm going to start off with number five. Then I might have a bit of a dabble in number two. You can't do that. It's one, two, three, four. You've got to do it step by step. That's a process model. Each circle is a similar size because a process model would suggest you spend the same amount of time and energy at each step of the process. And then the final bit, I can't really show it on the illustration, so it's in the words, but the final bit is a process model can only be used to reflect on action, to look back. It's only for the third stage of reflection. So really process models, they're written and designed to be used to look at a single incident, to look back, something's happened, look back at, back at it and work through a process of reflection. I think it is my personal view that universities focus too much on teaching process models of reflection. I get why they do that. There's a few reasons, but that's what I think they do. They focus overly on process models of reflection. Maybe there are a couple of reasons. I think process models are easier for us to get hold of. So I could see why we would start with learning process models. But then the problem is we, we believe that that is the whole of reflection and it's not. It's just one way of reflecting process models. When I qualified 30 odd years ago, we didn't really have lots of processes. We didn't use lots of processes and lots of social workers. If you just said to them, here's a process, they just said, oh no, we don't do that. We're very radical, we don't have processes. Nowadays, everybody loves a good process. What do I do next? What's the next bit? Everybody loves the process. Component models, look at the word component underneath in orange, it looks different. I've done it as a comparison. There are still six things. Again, it could be three or 10. It's not the number. There's still six things, but this time they're not little circles. They're cogs. There's six cogs. They're different sizes. They're grouped in different groups and there's no numbers on them. Really, that shows you what a component model looks like. All a component model does is it says, think about these components. Think about these things. Think about these aspects. You don't have to do it in any particular order. And you might spend more time thinking about one aspect, one component than another, because today that bit's more important. Tomorrow, I'm going to spend more time thinking about that other cog. But you can drive this. 
component models are much more flexible. In a way, a process model drives your reflection. It might be a good place to start, but it drives your reflection. A component model, you drive it, you control it. So it might be more difficult to do that if you're not feeling fully confident about reflection. Whenever I do reflective conversations with people, if I ask them to bring a component reflection or something, they'll often say things like, oh, I don't know if I've done it right. You don't get that when they're talking about process models. And I wonder if it's because the process model, you know what's being looked for. Number one, then number two, then number three. Component models leave people feeling less confident. But actually, once you've got a hold of a component model, they're often much more helpful because they're so much more flexible. You can use a component model to reflect on action, look back, or to reflect for action, look ahead, or to reflect on a whole period of time, not just a single incident. They're so much more widely usable. You can do such a lot more with them. The other thing that I would say to you is when you move into practice, you'll not be on a, on a child's file, for example, on an assessment you've written about a child. You're not gonna be writing a reflection in there but you're gonna be writing an analysis. Component skills, skills in using component models link you into analysis much more clearly. So if you're really thinking about, I need to develop my analytical skills, go for component models because it's gonna help you to develop in that way. So what I really want to do in tonight's session is I want to, you to feel that by the end of the session, you understand the difference between a process model and a component model. So I'm going to show you two examples of each. Some of them you'll be very familiar with, some of them you'll be less familiar with. So first example I'm going to give you is Gibbs. I mean, it's a classic process model. It's the most commonly taught model of reflection in, on social work in the UK, I think. Not in other countries necessarily. In other countries, they would be quite heavily critical of our use of Gibbs. Because what was Gibbs written for? Gibbs was written for nurses. It's a very medical model driven. Gibbs is a classic process model. Step one to step six. Look, you can't think, oh, I'll start off with stage six, can you? And work backwards, you can't do it. You've got to start at stage one and work through. So Gibbs says, describe the event. It's always about looking back. What happened? It's about a single event. Now this can be a really useful model for you to look at a single event. If you've got to write, a critical incident analysis, use this. It's a good one. It looks at a single incident, but it's not great to look at a long period of time. If you've got to write about your whole placement, you can't use this because it starts off with describe what happened. Well, a hundred things have happened on your placement. So that's the problem with it. But Gibbs is what happened? What were you feeling? What were you thinking? What went well? What didn't go well? What theory did you use? What legislation was relevant? Make the wider analytical links there. What have I learned? What will I do differently next time? Now, some people will say that's reflection, but it isn't. It's just one model of reflection. It's one way of reflecting. If you are somebody that can't, that that isn't a naturally reflective writer. Some people it comes natural and some people it doesn't. If you're not a naturally reflective writer, I wouldn't suggest Gibbs because I think Gibbs leads to quite descriptive writing from some people because they'll describe what happened, they'll describe how they felt, they'll describe what went well, what didn't go well. In going through each stage, they just continue to describe. But if it works for you, keep going. I mean, just find what works for you and go with it. That's Gibbs. That's your first process model. Second process model, Borton. Now, Borton wrote this for teachers. So Gibbs is for nurses. This was written for teachers. Um, some people will say to you this is the universities often say it's Rolf et al or Driscoll et al. It goes back to Borton. And the reason it's worth going back to the original is to see how long it's been around doesn't mean it's a bad thing because it's been around a long time. I've been around social work a long time. I don't think I'm a bad thing. I think it's, I'm all right as a social worker. I've been around a long time. It's not the problem that's been around a long time. The problem is, has it been kept up to date? Has it remained contemporary? Borton is a process model. 
It's a very simple process model, just three steps. What, so what, now what? Now, a couple of riders about this. It's not seen as a great model for social work education. If you're writing a reflective account, it's seen as being a bit simplistic. It's seen as only really sitting at an academic level five. So first year of a degree level is where what, so what now, what could be widely utilized. So it's not one that I'd recommend you getting too into because it's seen as being a bit overly simplistic. But the reason I've used it as an example is it's a very clear process model, isn't it? Step by step. You know, you can't start off with so what can you? you've got to start with what, then so what, then now what? So even though it's not got numbers against it, it's obvious that it is a process model. It is potentially useful in some ways. It's, it's seen as being useful in supervision where Kulchuma was talking about. Um, making bullet points. This could be useful for bullet pointing things. So, you know, as a model, it's it, it's got it's got good uses, I suppose, is what I'd say. So two process models. We're going to look at component models now, and I'm hoping that you're going to see that they are completely different. Here's the first process model. This is Court Hagen's reflective onion. This is a Scandinavian model. It comes from social pedagogy, which means it's much more closely related to social work than the first two. But it's not widely used in the UK. But Court Hagen says, look, reflection's like an onion. You've got to peel back the layers and each layer that you peel back, you see something else that you need to reflect on. And the more layers you peel back, the deeper and the stronger your reflection becomes. I think that's really useful. I mean, I'm a visual thinker and I love component models, so I'm obviously going to like this. But that's the thing about knowing yourself, knowing your style and then finding a model that suits you. I know this model suits me because, I, you know, I like the peeling back the layers stuff. But if you look at it, Court Hagen just says these are the layers for you to think about. These are the components. This is the stuff to consider. You don't have to consider it in any particular order. I mean, he suggests you start off thinking about the environment and you finish off thinking about your mission, but you could work backwards. You could do it in any order. You could use it before something happens. So you could plan ahead and think, I'm going on a visit tomorrow. What do I know about the environment that I'm going into? How am I going to behave when I get there? How do I think the other person is going to behave when I'm there? What competencies do I feel like I've got? What am I good at that I can do on this visit? But what am I a bit worried about? I'm not so capable at that I might need to do on this visit. So you get the idea you could use it before or you could use it after. If you're doing a direct observation of practice, this is a great model to use both before and after. This is what I thought about the environment and this is how the environment actually was afterwards. This is what I expected in terms of behaviour and this is what actually happened. It's much more usable and flexible, you see. You couldn't do that with Gibbs. You couldn't use Gibbs before and after. You can't. But you can use Court Hagen before and after. You could use Court Hagen to look back at a whole period of time. You could use Court Hagen to say, I'm going to look back at my whole placement. What's been the placement environment like? How have I behaved during the placement? What competencies have I developed during the placement? How have my beliefs? I think that's a mistranslation from the Scandinavian. I think it would be better if it said values, ethics, that sort of thing. But how have my values been influenced by the placement? Or how have I used my values? Or how have they grown or anything? My identity, who am I? And how has that identity helped me or hindered me or changed during the placement and then mission. If an onion had a core, Court Hagen would say, this is a core. What's my purpose? What's my mission? What's my reason for being? Now I find this really helpful at opening things up reflectively rather than descriptively. But some people find that they just describe the environment and describe behavior. So again, you've got to find the one that works for you. So the second example of a component model, 
I'm going to try and explain to you where it comes from and why looking at components is better. I've done a literature review of reflective practice in social work, basically. And this is what comes out of it. These are the themes that you will see coming out of a literature review. This is what you see in pretty much anything that's ever written about reflection. These are the themes that come out. Critical reflection means it's about rethinking or deconstructing power in a situation. That's what makes it critical. Reflection is always about an awareness of your values and the implications your values have on your practice. It's always about exploring your emotions, developing emotional intelligence. Reflection is about drawing on the knowledge that you've got and developing new knowledge and practice wisdom. Reflection is about self-awareness. Reflection is about creating uncertainty, asking lots of questions, not necessarily knowing the answers and being willing to live with that uncertainty. And they're really the components that make up reflection. Whatever you read about it, that's pretty much what makes up critical reflection. I'm gonna now look at an area of social work. Now we could look at any area of social work. We could look at multidisciplinary working. We could look at doing assessments. We're gonna look at safeguarding because really safeguarding is an issue for everybody. So everybody should be able to kind of relate into what I'm breaking down here. If you break down safeguarding in social work, you can break it down into the core components of it. There are always issues of power and powerlessness in safeguarding. We know that. We know that neglect and abuse is about power, powerlessness. There are very significantly changing societal values in terms of what we would um, see as being abusive or neglectful in the past and what we see as abuse now. Our values as a society have changed. There's always an, an emotional impact, potential distress for a worker dealing with safeguarding issues. There's a developing knowledge base, an emerging knowledge base. You know, we're only just beginning to really think about and understand um, exploitation as a safeguarding issue or contextual safeguarding, the knowledge base is very new, it's emerging. And then there's the impact of personal experiences and values and what one person sees as a really concerning safeguarding issue, another person doesn't. Why? That's about self-awareness. And then there are always more questions than answers when we're thinking about safeguarding. There's, you know, there's always stuff that you don't know. And you've got to be kind of aware of what's safe uncertainty and what is unsafe uncertainty in safeguarding. What should have come through there is the connectivity between the main components of reflective practice and the main components of safeguarding. As I said, we could have done assessment, interagency working, supervision, anything. The same kinds of issues are there. And for me, these are what for many years I've called the big six power, values, emotions, knowledge, self-awareness and uncertainty. And we've talked about these before in the webinars because I've suggested you could use these when you're writing a reflective account to think about or Think about writing um, an assignment. Have you covered all of these things? To me, they're the big six. When I went to write that big six up, I just did a quick check because you do have to do a check. Has that phrase come from somewhere? Why do I call them the big six? You know, and when I did a bit of a check on it, what comes up is those, the energy companies. They're called the big six. More recently, there's also been something about an FA football clubs or something, the big six football clubs. I don't understand that. But the big six is used about energy companies. I'm now dead cheesy. right? I used to think, oh, I won't call them the big six. Then I'll call it something else. The significant six, the special six. Oh, I didn't sit right. I still called it the big six in my head. So now I'm dead cheesy. And I just say the big six energizes your critical reflection. It brings energy to your reflection. Because really this is just about the components that you need to use and think about and how you connect that into your practice or what's going on. And so that's the big six. 
the big six is actually it's a really popular model people like it i think i did a youtube video on it because people wanted more about it There's, that's the image of the cards but the big six is a component model because it just says think about those things so what i'm suggesting to you is mix the models up process models might be the models that you've been taught at university component models will help you open out that reflection and some universities, I'm told, say you have to use this model. Well, if they say that and you're struggling with it, OK, write it to that model, but get the other prompts out, get the other models out and think about them to help you to bring more reflection into your writing. Maybe then you're going to structure it by sticking it into Gibbs or whatever models being suggested if you have to. But use the model that works for you. And so. Now, Kai's going to give us a bit of, um, well, he's going to share his practice wisdom, aren't you, really, Kai? That's what it is that you're bringing to us. So you're going to share your thoughts. I am, yeah. I'm not sure about wisdom, but we'll see. You can tell me afterwards. Um, yeah, so I was just going to go through sort of my journey with reflection, really, and um, the complexity that I found of it in itself, um, because I've just finished my first year, and so I'm quite new to the reflecting world. And when I first started, we had to, well, we were told we'd have to write a, re a reflective piece each week. And to me, that sounded complex because I'd never heard of reflection as a skill. Um, so I didn't really know how to use it in a way that was sort of meaningful or use, uh, useful. And I found at the beginning that models, and especially these process models that Siobhan's talks about, made it a lot less complicated for me because it gave, like Gibbs, for example, I don't really like Gibbs that much now, but at the beginning, it showed me like a real clear way um, to give me a better structure and it helped me understand what I was getting out of the reflection. Um, but now I think using models like Gibbs and other process models has sort of taken me through a bit of a journey where now I'm more capable of reflecting without using these structures, and I guess using more of these component models that Siobhan's talked about, um, they don't have such a set structure. And that means that now that I know what I want to get out of the reflection, I can think about it more creatively. Um, I don't have to follow a strict process. And I think that really helps develop things beyond, like you said, Siobhan, beyond the description and really start analysing what happened. And um, yeah. That's it, really. That's been the journey for me to hope we'll get to that point now. Mm, fab. Thanks, Kai. I do remember you telling us about having to keep a reflection every week. And I remember thinking that's actually quite tough because I don't know any other university program that in your first year you have to write a reflection and submit it every week. But actually, I think it's been really good because it has really supported you in that journey, hasn't it? And I, I get it. And I think it's been really helpful. Um, but then thinking about the start of tonight's webinar and all that knotty stuff that's all tied up what it's enabled you to do is sort of learning how to structure how to wrap up all of that knotty stuff and and unravel it I suppose really so that's really helpful thank you for sharing that and yes it was practice wisdom because it's wisdom based on writing a reflection every week for a year is quite significant amount so um Kai talked to us there about the journey and the image in the background. It's a nice image because you, you're on a journey in that um, photograph, I think, aren't you, Kai? Um, so this is a photo that uh, another team member took last week, I think it might have been. Brett, not sure whether it was last week or not, but um, lots of you know I'm trying to um, set up a reflective retreat for social workers at the moment. And in fact, in a couple of weeks, got a first group of, I think, eight students coming over to do uh, some guided reflection in, in, at the retreat. And um, Brett's brilliant at taking photos and he's visited a couple of times. Every time he visits, the weather's terrible. <laughs> so he's not going to get any great photos yet. But um, this is my favourite space to reflect. This is uh, in, in the garden where I just at lunchtime, I'll just go. It doesn't matter whatever the weather is. I'll go and sit there at lunchtime. And I'll think about how the morning's gone and what I'm going to do in the afternoon and how I need to do things differently or whatever it is. But for me, that's my favourite reflective spot. It's a little short walk away from um, where I sit and then I'll just sit there, eat, eat a sandwich or drink 
my soup or whatever it is I'm having for lunch. And I just think it's a lovely space because of what you can see in front of you. But the weather, I'll go there, whatever the weather is, whether the weather is lovely, whether the weather is rotten, the view is going to be different every day. Some days you can't see the mountains and other days you've got really clear views for long distances. But that's made me think about one of my favourite models of reflection is the weather model. And I wanted to finish off, I suppose, talking about the weather model and how you could use the weather model when we're thinking about dealing with complexity. So this weather model is a model that I developed with a group of students. It's probably about 25 years ago now. I try and encourage people to develop their own model of reflection, what works for them. In fact, webinar 20, we did a, uh, where people came and shared that, no, it wasn't webinar 20, there might have been 10. One of the webinars we did, people came along and shared their own model of reflection. We had some great models of reflection that people had developed for themselves. In webinar 20, I think Di shared her model of reflection. That's why I'm thinking number 20. But along the way, we've had lots of people come and share their own models. You could develop your own model. I did this with a group of students years ago and we just developed it. I talked about it in training and then people were like, oh, we love that. Write it up. I had to write it up. But I use it in different ways now. And there are three different ways of using the weather model. And the thing about developing your own model is it becomes much more fluid and you can develop it and use it in different ways. So I'm going to tell you about the three different ways to use the weather model. The weather model, for me, I would use it to look back over a long period of time. As a practice educator working with students, I use a different model every week. So we talk about the model of the week and we have a different model that week. And I always use the weather model towards the end of placement. And we use it to look back at the whole placement because it's a really good one for looking at a long period of time. So if you're asked to think about a piece of work, a whole piece of work you've done, use the weather model. It's really good. Rather than a single thing, it's good to look at a whole period or a whole piece of work. And this is how I used to use it. I used to say to the student, Kai talked about his journey. I would say to students, at the end of your placement, let's look back at your journey of the placement and tell me about the sunshine. So tell me what went well. What are you most proud of? Then I'd say, let's talk about the rain. What didn't go as well for you? What, what would you change? What improvements would you make? I'd say, tell me about the lightning. Is there anything that shocked you during the placement? What about fog? Is there anything that you couldn't see? Where did you get lost? How did the fog clear? I literally had a question for every type of weather. I got to the point I was watching weather reports just to hear, is there a kind of weather I've not incorporated into the model yet? I mean, literally, I'd have a question associated to every kind of weather, ice, when did you slip up, um, wind, what was blowing you off course, hail, what was painful, every kind of weather I had a question associated with. And I was doing this a few years ago with a student I was working with, Sandy, and we were doing this at the end of her placement, and I was still writing down what she was saying. And I said to her, I can't even remember what we were on, maybe we were on ice, where did you slip up? And I said to her, Oh, we'll do the snow question next. But then I thought, oh, I've not written that down. I just wrote something down. And I didn't say to her what the snow question was. And she started to tell me about what had been the most fun for her on the placement. And I can remember vividly in the moment, reflecting in the moment, sitting there thinking, what's she talking about? What's she going on about? She thought I was going to ask her what was the most fun, because to her, snow is fun. To me, snow is stay inside, get out water bottle, make sure you've got a tin of soup. That's snow to me. And that made me realise in that moment, I've got this model all wrong. Because the weather means different things to different people. So now I use it completely differently. Now I say, tell me about the sunshine moment of your placement. Well, I get so many different things. Now, I've had somebody recently who said to me, oh, I don't like the sun, I get prickly heat. So they told me about all the irritating bits about their placement. Someone else told me about getting sunstroke because they thought they were given too much work to do and it kind of overwhelmed them. Somebody else told me about getting sunburnt because they'd not prepared very well for something. It went a bit wrong, they got burnt by it. So other, quite a few people have talked about the warmth of the team and the environment that they've been in. You get completely different things. So now 
I would just get you to reflect on a period of time. Look back at your placement, look back at your ASYE first six months or look back at the last year and think to yourself, what's been the sunshine moment for me? What's been the rainy moment? It's great. It works really well. And then the third way to use it, develop a personal weather report. This is great. I love doing this. I did it today, actually, for myself. The idea is just what's the weather feel like for you at the moment? If I had to ask you to describe and you could put this in the chat, it would be brilliant to hear people's weather reports in the chat, actually. If you had to use three types of weather to describe how you're feeling at the moment about work or about your studies or about whatever, what would those three pieces of weather be? It's brilliant. It works really well. You can also open it out into thinking about how you might forecast the weather. Honestly, the weather model is so good. In so many ways, we are like weather reporters, social workers are, because we're making predictions based on the information we've got. We're saying what we think is going to happen. We're not sure. It's not an exact science. We think this is going to happen. And when we get it right, nobody mentions it. When we get it wrong, everybody talks about it, just like weather reports. So it works. It just sits well with social work. Here's another picture. This is one I took from the um, back door. Where I live now, they say, if you don't like the weather, just wait half an hour. And that's true because the weather constantly changes. But that's the thing about social work. The complexity is everything is constantly changing. And that rainbow, in fact, it's a double rainbow. I don't, the picture didn't quite capture it, but it is a double rainbow. And the rainbow could be your components of reflection. Again, this was developed by a group of newly qualified workers, actually, where they based it around the colours of the rainbow and the things that we need to reflect on in social work. Red, Think about relationships. Orange, think about the organizational issues and what's going on in the organization. Yellow is you, your feelings, your emotions. Green is your goals. What are you trying to achieve here? And blue is the barriers. What's stopping you getting there? And indigo is your identity, who you are. And violet is values. That's a lovely little model of reflection. Develop your own. All a model of reflection is about is giving you a structure to help you to find that simplicity in the complexity. That rainbow is just very simple. The weather is very simple, but it really helps you to reflect on that complexity. And the final thing I'm going to ask you to do today to unravel all of that complexity is I want you to write down some words. These are the words that I want you to write down. I want you to write down the word complexity because that's where we started off tonight, thinking about complexity. And then I want you to write down the word perplexing. Now I said this word recently and um, this made, they made me feel really old. They went, is that an old fashioned word? I've never heard it. Is that like an ancient word? Comple uh, perplexing is basically if you're working with something, um, and you find it perplexing, it means you don't know, you can't find it, you don't, you, you're a bit confused, a bit discombobulated, a bit anxious, a bit, it's sort of all of that in one, but it's a feeling, being perplexed is a feeling. So you've written down perplexing, then I'm going to ask you to write down the word flexibility, because you need to be flexible with all of this. The models that we use need to be flexible. And then I'm going to ask you to finish off by thinking about reflexivity, because that's our aim in reflection is get to the point of reflexivity. So you've got four words there, really important keywords, and we're going to find the simplicity in all of this. And the simplicity in all of it sits around the journey. The treasure is in the word. It's in the E and the I that sits around the X. X marks the spot. There's a map for your journey. X marks the spot. It's all about the E and the I. 
We've been talking tonight about complexity, but all of those words, perplexing, flexibility, reflexivity, around the X, they've got an E and an I. It's all the same pattern. EI is short for emotional intelligence. What you need to bring to your reflection is emotional intelligence. I could stand for individual. E is all about the environment. How do you connect the individual and the environment? The I could stand for internal factors and the E for external factors. I is about me, myself. E is about the event or the environment. So this is all about how we connect the I and the E. How do you connect yourself with the environment, with the event and reflect on it? The treasure is bringing that connectivity together. What you need to do to deal with some of this complexity in a reflexive way is find a model of reflection that suits both the situation and your learning style. I and the event, I and E. The complexity, the simplicity, break it down, get the I and the E, me and the event and choose the reflective model that's going to work. So some initial thoughts that I've got are, if you want to reflect back on a particular incident, if you write in like a critical incident analysis, then process models can work really well for that. Something like Gibbs or Kolb or Johns, but so will a model like the big six. So if you prefer components, go for a component model like the big six, where you can draw out these six things seem to thread through. If you want to reflect on a period of time, like say a, a placement or a period of employment or a longer piece of work, then the weather model is really good for that. But so are component models like Court Hagen's Onion. Quick methods like surprises to learning or head, heart, hands and feet, they're really good to do a rapid reflection. We've not talked about those tonight. We've talked about them in other sessions. But if you want to do something quick and rapid and easy, those or even the what, why, how framework, they're good for rapid stuff. Even what, so, what, now, what can work well. And then use a range of prompts and see what works for you and for the environment or the events or... I think the reflective practice prompt cards are great. I mean, I suppose I would say that because I wrote them, but you know, they're the thing that I use the most in my own practice in terms of the things that I've developed. They're the things that I use, the reflective practice prompt cards. But don't forget, so many people go straight to the cards. They don't look at the booklet that comes with them. They don't look at the advice that comes with them. There's YouTube videos about how to use them, all of that. But those prompts will open it out. There are so many more ways of reflecting than a classic linear, let's look back and think about what went well, what didn't go well, and what we'll do differently next time. Reflection and analysis goes way beyond that. And I'm hoping that tonight has helped you to think about that and explore that really. Okay, so we're just about, we've unraveled the complexity into the simplicity. So if we finish off, as we ordinarily do, by talking about what we've got coming up, we've just got three more sessions left for this season, and then we'll be finishing um, until September. We'll be back in September um, with, I think it'll be season six then, won't it? I think we're on season five at the moment. Next week, we are continuing our commitment to anti-racism. Uh, we try and do a session every season on anti-racist practice because it's so vital in terms of social work. And next week is going to be led by special guest Chantelle Thomas. She's going to be looking at adultification and whether that's a social work issue. On Wednesday, the 22nd of June, we're going to have a panel webinar looking at neurodiversity and social work. Um, Kelly's taking the lead on that. We might have a slightly different title when it comes to it, but I'm really looking forward to that session. And then our final session of the season, we'll be back to an A to Z because we love to finish on an A to Z. We're going to do an A to Z of social work education this season. We've just been tying up, finishing off the letters that we're going to do. And I think that'll be a great session. 
So um, if you want to join up for the next couple of sessions, I'm sure that Dave or the team have put the link into the chat so that you can go straight into registering for next week. But thank you ever so much for joining us tonight and for starting us off with the smiles, sharing your smile of the day. Um, I hope that uh, you continue to smile tomorrow. Good night, everybody. Goodbye. <laughs>